2020 and we are live hope everybody's doing well it's uh been a very very busy week already want to welcome everybody welcome everybody to the african history network show today it's tuesday november 10th 2020 and uh it's been a very very busy day so on today's show uh, we're going to deal with the Wilmington Massacre of 1898. The Wilmington Massacre of 1898 took place on November 10th, 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina. And this was America's only successful um, coup d'etat. And it overthrew a biracial government that was elected in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and it was overthrown by a white supremacist. So we're going to talk about that in the uh, second part of the show. First part of the show, we'll do our uh, news recap of what's going on today. Uh, we'll deal with uh, a record number of coronavirus cases. Uh, we're set today, 135,000 nationwide. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in the uh, post-election uh debacle that's taking place we'll give you an update on that and then we'll get into some history dealing with the wilmington massacre of 1898 this is a, a deep deep history lesson uh my friend director christopher everett is the director of the film wilmington on fire wilmington on fire we're going to uh um reach out to him and get him on soon for an interview but i've talked about the wilmington massacre uh in the past a uh, number of times in the past, I've dealt with it in, in uh, some lectures that I've done. So it's a, a very, very important history lesson. And it deals with uh, one of the things that it shows you is the fight for uh, power, the fight for power. And when we look at uh, race rise that have taken place uh, throughout our history, usually it's three main reasons why these race rides take place, uh, either one, it's over political power or voting rights or African-Americans trying to exercise their right to vote. Two, it's over jobs or economic issues. OK, it's uh, a lack of jobs and African-Americans being attacked because it's perceived that they took jobs away from white people like we saw during the uh, red summer of 1919. OK, or uh, economic envy, like we saw with the attack on uh, Black Wall Street in 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or it's over sex or it's over sex and uh, African-Americans, specifically African-American men being attacked because it was said that they raped a white woman or was caught in bed with a white woman or they were dreaming about a white woman or something like that. OK, so usually those are the three main reasons why you see race riots, massacres, um, African-Americans being lynched, et cetera. Those are usually the three main reasons. OK, so uh, we'll deal with those uh, uh, topics tonight. And then also Joe Biden uh, gave a speech today and uh, he was uh, talking about the uh, uh, coronavirus and talking about a path forward. And, he, and Biden says Trump's refusal to concede is an embarrassment. Trump's refusal to concede is an embarrassment. So we'll talk about all this and more on today's edition of the African History Network show. So we're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, uh, on YouTube. So everybody share this broadcast. Uh, on your social media platforms and invite your friends to tune in. We're also broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. Superstations, uh, 9, 10 a.m. Uh, the Superstation WFDF in Detroit. We're broadcasting on their Facebook fan page also. Now, on the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you haven't taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, 
the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So this helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. And we're here six nights a week now, six days a week, as opposed to one day a week. I was doing Sundays. 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for four years here on 19 a.m. Superstation WFDF in Detroit. But starting October 12th, we started doing Monday through Fridays, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight also. So I mean, it's six days a week. OK, so um, when you buy our DVD lectures at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and, and my lectures there, or you, or you donate to the African History Network, it helps us to keep broadcast and keep doing the research and stay on the air. OK. Uh, Call in numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call in number. If you have a question or comment, 313-778-7600. If you have a quick question or comment, we're not going to have time for dissertations and manifestos tonight. Okay, I'm serious. And then, uh, okay, Jay Carla, she posted the link to Cash App. Oh, Jay Carla's on it. She's posting this stuff. Thank you, Jay Carl. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So let's jump into uh, uh, our news roundup segment here and everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. So when we look at coronavirus, now remember Donald Trump said after November 3rd, you're not going to hear any more about coronavirus. No, he wishes that you didn't hear anything else about coronavirus after November 3rd. It's getting worse day by day. It's not getting better. It's not going away. It's getting worse day by day. Now, the U.S. tops for, for Tuesday, uh, November 10th, 2020, uh, the U.S. Uh, tops uh, record for new coronavirus cases as death toll surpasses 1,000 for a third day. For the third time in the past week, the U.S. set a record for new coronavirus infections on Tuesday, November 10th at 135,428. 135,428 new coronavirus infections recorded in one day as local and state leaders ordered restrictions to reduce the transmission of the virus and prepare for an anticipated flood of hospitalizations. As reported to you yesterday, you have about 56,000 people hospitalized across the country for coronavirus. It is getting worse. It's not getting better. It's not going away. It's not just going to disappear like Donald Trump said said early in the year in states where the infections and hospitalizations have surged many leaders called for people to socially distance and wear masks to prevent the virus spread some went so far as to impose new rules on gatherings and businesses now the daily death toll records were uh, uh daily death toll records were surpassed in uh Missouri Wisconsin Alaska Wyoming and North Dakota at least 239,000 people have died of coronavirus in the United States as of February this year. The Trump administration uh, uh, officials promised to fairly and swiftly distribute the first COVID-19 antibody treatment. But there is extremely uh, limited. There is an extremely limited supply and lo logistical difficulties in administering the drug. Now, we saw the Supreme Court today heard the the uh, review. They uh, reviewed the latest Republican challenge to the Affordable Health Care Act. We saw that case and there is suspected to rule any day now, uh, as NBC News reported in Los Angeles Times, uh, based upon the arguments made is not suspected that the uh, you're going to get five justices to rule to end the Affordable Health Care Act. We'll see what happens. Now, investors held a breakthrough in the development of a coronavirus vaccine on Tuesday, but they also signal hesitation as infection as infections uh, uh, spike, as infections increase. When we look at um, Dr. Anthony Fauci was interviewed uh, today, Tuesday, November 10th, and the CDC now says face masks can also protect the wearer. The, uh, the CDC says face masks can also protect the wearer. Um, he was interviewed on CNN. He was also interviewed on MSNBC by Andrea Mitchell. Uh, face masks can protect the wearer 
as well as others from the spread of coronavirus, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advised in updated guidance Tuesday in the agency's strongest endorsement yet for coverings. Masks are able to offer personal protection. Masks are able to offer personal protection because they filter the respiratory droplets uh, predominantly responsible for the virus's transmission, according to uh, according to a research summary published by the agency. And uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci talked about that when he was interviewed on MSNBC today also. Now, the advice goes on to endorse, quote, universal masking policies, universal masking policies, which is a contrast to uh, Donald Trump's rejection of mask mandates. If masks were increased by 15 percent, mask wearing was increased by 15 percent in the United States, further lockdown could be avoided and the associated economic losses would be reduced by up to one trillion dollars or about five percent of the gross domestic product the gdp according to an analysis edited by the center for disease control and prevention let me repeat this for all the all the republicans out there that want to talk about open back up the economy and the and the prescription can't be worse than the cure but i mean look i mean people are dying Look, I mean, people are dying from coronavirus. If mask wearing increased by just 15 percent in the United States, further lockdowns could be avoided and the associated economic losses would be reduced by up to one trillion dollars or about five percent of the GDP. Uh, this, uh, the CDC in this analysis said adopting universal masking policies can help avert future lockdowns, especially if combined with other non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as social distancing, hand hygiene, and adequate ventilation. Now, public health experts have long recommended face coverings to prevent the spread of coronavirus to other people, but mounting scientific evidence has confirmed the belief that those who wear masks are also less at risk of becoming infected. Let me repeat this. But mounting scientific evidence has confirmed the belief that those who wear masks are also less at risk of becoming infected. Okay, so let me, when we talk about masks, let me just make this very clear. It's surgical masks. You can't wear, now this is late night radio, you know, and we, you know, we got Michael Bazin on at 1 a.m. Okay, I'm Michael also. So so when, when we wear this mask, you know, like this may go outside of the covers of some people's wearing this, right? When, you know, sp some people go to certain type of parties, they wear masks. We ain't talking about those type of masks. You gotta wear like surgical masks. Cover up your mouth. Okay. I just I just want to make this clear. All right. You you don't wear masks like you wear like the certain parties. You don't that, that we're not talking about that type of mask. All right. I just I just want to make sure that we, we're all on the same page. Okay. Uh <laughs> now recent data has now shown that as a matter of fact, there's also the added benefit to protect you from droplets and virus that's coming your way. Dr. Anthony Fauci director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, told MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell on Tuesday. Um, he said it's a two way street. Let me repeat. Recent data has now shown that, as a matter of fact, there's also the added benefit to protect you from droplets and virus that's coming your way uh, as well. It's a two way street. OK, now uh, and then, OK, U.S. Uh, top U.S. tops record for new infections as more states impose restrictions. OK, look at the updates from the Washington Post. They have some really, really good up to the minute updates from the Washington Post dealing with coronavirus. And then uh, also uh, look at NBC News dot com and New York Times for updates. Um, on Tuesday, November 10th, with 135,428 reported cases, this was a uh, a record of new coronavirus cases uh, set nationwide. The daily coronavirus related death toll was 1,403 on, on today as well. The highest count since mid-August, 1,403 is not going down, is not going away. It's getting worse. And because it's colder outside in general across the country, because it's cold outside, people are retreating indoors more. And this allow and people are in closer proximity to one another. And this allows us to spread. And for the first time since July, it's the first time since late July, more than sixty one thousand nine hundred people uh, are battling coronavirus 
uh, in hospitals since the first time since late July, 61,900 people are being hospitalized for coronavirus. Now, the seven day average of infections in the U.S. is now above 120,000 as the country appears poised to overtake these highs by later this week. Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana top previous highs for new cases, while daily death tolls were surpassed in Missouri, Wisconsin, Alaska, Wyoming, and North Dakota. When we look, um, when we look here in uh, Michigan, we see uh, Governor Gretchen Whitholm did a, a press conference today. I think it was today. Uh, we see that uh, in, in Michigan, there's a new single day record of 6,473 cases. And then also we see 84 new deaths reported in the state of Michigan as of uh, Tuesday, uh, November 10th. Um, OK, how much time? OK. One minute before the break. Now, Michigan continues to see record COVID-19 uh, cases. And with the rise in cases comes an increase in hospitalizations in the state of Michigan. Over the past 26 days, Michigan has seen a 215 percent increase in hospitalizations, a 140 percent, a 146 percent increase in patients on ventilators and a 137 percent increase in patients uh, in the ICU. Check out the updates from uh, WXYZ Channel 7 in Detroit, WXYZ.com. Michigan sets new record high single day total with 6,473 COVID-19 cases. This is what happens when you have incompetent leadership in the White House. Speaking of incompetency, um, uh, Joe Biden gave a, a press conference today and uh, he called out President Trump for his refusal to concede. He said, I just think it's an embarrassment, quite frankly. Biden told reporters in Wilmington, Delaware, he said, I think it will not help the president's legacy. We're already uh, beginning the transition, he said. We're, all, we're well underway and the ability f uh, for the administration in any way by failing to recognize our win does not change the dynamic at all, end quote. All right, we're coming up on a break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Yaya Rule is a line of African print inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone, whether you are working in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur, or an artist. Their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or dress it up as wanted. It is for those who have already embraced African fabrics and for those who are just getting introduced to them. Reclaim and experience a part of our culture with rich and colorful 
African prints. The clothing line and the accessories are available right now starting at $17.99. For more information on the new items and accessories, visit yayarule.com. Gain knowledge in minutes with Blacklist Ed. Blacklist Ed is an app that provides insightful summaries of books pertaining to the black experience. As black people, we know the importance of reading books to discover our incredible contributions to world history, to uplift our self-esteem, and to empower ourselves for our relentless fight for social justice. Unfortunately, with our busy lives, it feels like there is never enough time to read a book. Fortunately, there's a solution. With Blacklist Ed, their app provides key insights from best-selling books about the black experience, therefore saving you time, increasing your knowledge, and empowering yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. You can read or listen on the go. Start your free trial today by going to blacklisted.com. That's black without the C, B-L-A-K. Or you can download the Blacklist Ed app from the App Store or Google Play. Blacklist Ed, empower yourself. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Tuesday, November 10th, 2020, and we are live. Uh, right before the break, we wrapped up our news uh, uh, roundup segment dealing with what's going on with coronavirus, what's going on uh, on the uh, post-election uh, trail. We'll give you some more uh, updates uh, on tomorrow's show as well. Um, Donald Trump is still not conceding, but he doesn't have to concede. He just has to uh, pack his stuff up and call Tyrone and help him move out. <laughs> right. <laughs> January 20th. You better call Tyrone. <laughs> Tell him to help you come get your sugar honey iced tea. That's all it is. You you ain't gotta you don't have to concede. All right. So all right. Um let's get to the uh Wilmington massacre of uh 1898. So I've talked about this before, and this takes place after Reconstruction. So Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877. Um, 1898 is right around the same time as the grandfather clause, which is a, an attempt to keep African-Americans from voting as well, where you have um, if you they stipulated if you're in a lot of these southern states, if you if your grandfather couldn't vote because he was a slave or if your grandfather was a slave, then you can't vote either. Uh, we see these um, efforts taking place starting right around 1870 and after 1870, when, when you have the 15th Amendment, the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which um, guaranteed and protected the right of African, it protected the right of African-American men to vote. As we talked about before, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. Nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. OK. All right. So. If we uh, I'll give you a few different sources on this. And uh, we posted an article today from uh, EJI dot org, uh, the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, they have an article November 10th, 1898, white mobs lead racialized political coup in North Carolina. Uh, and they talk about the only acknowledged coup d'etat in the United States in United States history occurred on November 10th, 1898 when mobs of armed white supremacists descended on City Hall in Wilmington, North Carolina, and forced both uh, black and white elected officials to resign. Two days earlier, Wilmington voters had elected a biracial city government to the dismay of white groups known as Red Shirts. Red Shirts, and the Red Shirts were like a, were a white supremacist paramilitary group, the Red Shirts. Um, and they and the red shirts uh, had tried to intimidate African American voters. Uh, so you, a lot of times when we talk about these different groups, they they just talk about the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was like the most well known group, but they weren't the only. You had the Ku Klux Klan, the Black Legions, the uh, the Black Legion, the Knights of the White Camellia, the Red Shirts. You're going to have a lot of these different domestic terrorists, white domestic terrorist groups. And then you have some that didn't just have names. It was just white men with guns and, and, and they ain't had names. So just because 
just because you have a group that um um put on white sheets okay just because you have a group that put on white sheets and put on a uh, white hoods does not mean they were the ku klux klan all right so we have to keep that in mind also all right uh let's continue here just a second stand by okay Let's continue. Share this broadcast on social media platforms. Uh, invite your friends to tune in also. Yeah, so so you, you're going to have a number of these different white domestic terrorist groups. Uh, just uh, the Ku Klux Klan was only one of them. And you're going to have different incarnations of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, the, so the Ku Klux Klan was founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, they're, they're founded a few days after the 13th amendment was ratified, which was ratified, uh, December 6th, 1865 adopted December 18th, 1865. And, um, by 1915, the Klan is largely going to die out. They're going to be rejuvenated in 1915. And a lot of that has to do with the film, the birth of a nation that showed the Klan as being the heroes of the movie. Then you have another incarnation of the Klan in like the around the 1960s during the civil rights movement as well. But if we look at this, um, I want to look at this article I've talked about before. This is from PBS.org and a series they have dealing with the rise and fall of Jim Crow, the rise and fall of uh, Jim Crow. Um, in 1898, Wilmington, North Carolina, located in Eastern Carolina, um, where the Cape Fear River enters into the Atlantic Ocean, there was a prosperous port town, a prosperous port town. Almost two thirds of its population was African-American with a small but significant middle class, a small but significant middle class. OK, this is 1898. This is four years after uh, Frederick Douglass has passed away. This is uh, like 11 years after it was. Um, 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 20, I think 21 years after, um, the, uh, reconstruction in, and then, and, um, you have, uh, this is the year before James Weldon Johnson writes the poem that's going to become known as lift every voice and sing the black national anthem. He wrote that in 1899. Okay. So almost two thirds of his population was African-American with a small, but significant middle class, uh, black businessmen dominated the restaurant and barbershop trade and owned, uh, tailor shops and drug stores. Uh, many black people held jobs as firemen, policemen, and civil servants. A good feeling between the races existed as long as white Democrats controlled the uh, the state politically. But when a coalition of predominantly white populists and African-American Republicans defeated the Democrats in 1896 and won political control of the state, Democrats vowed revenge in 1898. Uh, for many Democrats, um, African-American political power no matter how limited was intolerable. Okay. Now this is, um, as you've, we've talked about before, this is long before the party realignment takes place. The party realignment is going to be complete between the democratic and Republican party is going to be uh, complete in the mid to late sixties, but that's pre uh, that's precipitated by the Lily white movement in 1928 when Republicans use a Southern strategy to get Herbert Hoover elected as president and they appeal to Southern segregationist Democrats and five former Confederate states to get them to vote for Herbert Hoover, the Republican against Al Smith, who was um, a, a moderate uh, Democrat from New York. OK, Al Smith was running against Herbert Hoover in the 1928 presidential election. Herbert Hoover's going to win the election. And we talked about Herbert Hoover uh, last week when we dealt with the stock market crash in 1929 that took place in October 1929. While Herbert Hoover was president, Herbert Hoover mishandling that economic crisis uh, led to him being a one term president. And he lost to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He lost to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in that 1932 presidential election, just as Donald Trump mishandled the coronavirus pandemic 
which led to an economic crisis. And he's a one term president also. All right. So now Daniel uh, Schink, uh, S-C-H-E-N-C-K, a part uh, who was a party leader, warned, quote, it will be the meanest, vilest, dirtiest campaign since 1876. The slogan of the Democratic Party from the mountains to the sea will be but one word N word. This is what he said. OK, now, 1876, we talked about um, the 1876 presidential election. We just talked about that a few days ago because November 7th, 1876. Uh, well, November 7th um, on a November 7th show, we talked about how um, and right around there, I think November 7th was a Saturday. I was on rolling show that Saturday or Friday. I'm all my days run together anyway. But we talked about how November 7th, 1876 was uh, a presidential election day and, and the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes did not have enough electoral college votes or did not win enough electoral college votes to become president elect. He was running against the Democrat Samuel J. Tilden. And this led to the compromise of 1877 where the Republicans in, in, in exchange for Rutherford B. Hayes becoming president, the Republicans agreed to remove the Union troops out of the South which were protecting to a certain extent the rights of the former enslaved Africans because the de the Democrats wanted the Union troops removed out of the South so they could fully regain uh, white supremacy in the South. OK, so this was the compromise of 1877, which ended Reconstruction. All right. That, and, and so that that was the result of that uh, presidential election. All right. So Daniel Schink, a party leader, warned, quote, it will be the meanest, vilest, dirtiest campaign since 1876. The slogan of the Democratic Party from the mountain to the sea will be what be but one word N word is what he said. OK, the, the Democrats launched their campaign. By appealing. To the deep. of white women were in, in danger from black males, women women were in danger from black males. No, so just for people who history when you you had a part of the realignment that takes place in the mid to late 1800s because of the Civil Rights Act the action September 
Okay. By 1960, two thirds of African Americans over to the Democrats. So, contrary to popular belief we didn't switch over that no in the 1928 because our can party credit party party we saw receptive reception the more planned the republic ran segregated crack democratic republican party in these especially arizona in the nice uh democrat or the republic of them are going to go that two pain even to your children you have trump this time 18 were in dan and georgia early there was i have a background that message have 18 news paying to the african scare uh especially so rebecca fit two question from a week uh i'm gonna public if it requires i say lunch a thousand negroes a week if it is necessary end quote now uh th this article infuriated alex manley now alex manley was um the uh he was an african-american man who was the uh editor of the uh daily record newspaper which is a black newspaper there uh in wilmington north carolina he replied by writing an editorial sarcastically noting that many of these so-called lynchings for uh rape were actually cover-ups for the discovery of consensual interracial sexual relations okay he, he published this in the newspaper. He, 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 what he said was that many of these interactions, these sexual interactions between African-American men and white women, okay, um, um, he said many of these lynchings uh, claiming that they were for rape, but it was really trying to cover up consensual sex between African-American men and white women. When... Ida B. Wells got involved in the um, anti-lynching movement because of the uh, mass store murders of 1892 in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And um, her friend, a uh, friend, uh, Tom Moss, who was a, a grocery store owner on the people's grocery store. And he was a postal um, postal worker, a mailman. Um, when he and his friends were lynched, uh, she started investigating lynchings and she found that a lot of the lynchings were actual they were actually in retaliation for consensual sex between African-American men and white women. OK, and she wrote about this. She published about this as well in, in the newspaper that she was the editor of. Um, PBS.org has an article dealing with uh, Ida B. Wells and. Um, how she got involved in the anti-lynching movement. All right. So this is that there's a historical context for this. So this is why I say when, when we look at these race riots that take place and like a cause of a lot of these lynchings right through our history is three main reasons. One, it was dealing with political power or African-Americans trying to vote. Two, it was dealing with economics. So um, African-Americans getting jobs that white people didn't think they should have or getting promotions on jobs, things like this, or having prosperous towns like like uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Or we can look at the um, and then we look at elections back November 2nd. We talked about the uh, Okoy, Florida massacre of November 2nd, 1920 on Election Day in Okoy, Florida. And almost and approximately 50 African-Americans were killed and um, a lot of them were trying to vote, things like this. Um, so we so we see these either or it's dealing with sex. OK, it's dealing with sex. And there's a whole there's a whole history behind this dealing with sex, because when we talk about um, uh, preserving genetic white survival and we deal with the, the history of the Moors in Europe. And how the African Moors who go into Europe in 711 AD and go all throughout Europe, go into Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, Germany, Czechoslovakia, uh, Austria, they go all throughout France, Italy. And in these 
African Moors intermixed with the European population and changed the complexion of Europeans to various extent. This is how you get a Queen Charlotte Sophia and Queen Charlotte Sophia was of African Moorish descent on her mother's side, at least on her mother's side. But she was the wife to King George III. King George III was the king that the 13 colonies are revolting against during the American Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. When you look at uh, 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 paintings of Queen Charlotte Sophia, because photographic cameras didn't exist. Of Queen Charlotte Sophia, the older the painting, the darker her complexion is. All right. And then when we look at Charlottesville, Virginia, where the um, August 2017 Unite the Rally took place, where the white supremacists uh, ha had the rally in Charlottesville. All right. And uh, Heather Heyer, the, the, the white female uh, activist, was killed um, in, in, in what took place there. Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, is named after Queen Charlotte Sophia, who was a woman of African descent. OK, so uh, when we go and look at this, when we go and look at this, this history, we look at uh, Alexander De, uh, De Medici, uh, the um, um, he was in. Florence, Italy, the Archduke of Florence, Italy, I think uh, I think it was Alexander de Medici. And uh, w w when you look at the book, um, one of the books that deals with this is Black Star, the African Presence of Early Europe by um, Renoko Rashidi. And you got the book right here from Renoko. Um, it deals with this history of Africans going all throughout all throughout Europe and what happens. OK, uh, yeah, Alessandro de Medici, yeah, the Duke, the Duke of uh, Florence, the Duke of Florence and Florence, Italy. Um, this is uh, Alessandro de Medici. OK, but you when, when we deal with this history, uh, um, talk about genetic white survival. How. What race. is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race that comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Racism is a system distributed based upon comes out of European studies see that to make it to race to uh, intermix sexually and it was largely directed between African men and, and white women okay to, to keep them from intermixing sexually because when we study the history of what happened with the Moors in Europe, we see that there is going to be um, a a backlash to the intermixing taking place. And uh, when and what happens is, is when Europeans come out of the Dark Ages in the late 1400s and going to the 1500s and going to the renaissance era and then when they start circumnavigating the globe and they even start doing this we see in the mid 1400s and then uh 1482 uh with columbus selling around the west coast of africa things like this but as these europeans start to come out of the dark ages and and sail around the world they start seeing that the majority of the people they're coming in contact with are not european and as they intermix with these indigenous populations, they also see that the child, the offspring is not African, is not white anymore in general, not white. OK, but they saw this for hundreds of years in Europe also. So when you start seeing when you start seeing colonies being set up. And when you start to see them enslaving Africans and and uh, the, the Spanish doing this, the Spanish are the second ones to get involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The first the, the, the Portuguese are the first ones in 1441. But when you see them setting up these colonies and the, them putting laws in the place and um, in, in these various colonies, they're, they're, oftentimes they're putting in laws that outlaw miscegenation, outlaw the intermixing of the races because they're trying to preserve genetic white survival now they didn't always abide by that but you you see this attempt so when we see the lynchings taking place 
which is domestic terrorism. It wasn't just domestic terrorism is also trying to keep African men from intermixing with white women because they know that that child, when they comes out, ain't going to be white anymore. And they know if that continues to take place, that intermixing continues to take place, it would genetically wipe off white people off the face of the earth. So they're putting they're putting mechanisms in place to keep this from taking place. So when we study the history, when we study this history, it, it, we have to understand a continuum of history. What happened in Europe for hundreds of years is connected to 1898, is connected to slavery in this country because the English are coming here setting up colonies where the English were dealing with the African Moors. All this history is connected. We have to understand a chronology of history. We can't start studying the transatlantic slave trade in 1441, or we can't start studying it, studying it in 1619 here. No, it's a continuum of history. All right. So um, we're almost out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Let me see how much time we have left. For, uh, okay. Okay, five minutes. All right, let's go to this clip here. Uh, let's. We're going to go to the clip from uh, Vox.com uh uh shakita this deals with um the woman to massacre of 1898 we'll get a few minutes of this clip in let's go to this clip is it playing the the clip i sent you uh with Wilmington Massacre from Vox.com. It's on YouTube. For a long time, if you went to the library in Wilmington, North Carolina, there was one thing you weren't allowed to research. We were refused. We were rejected by the librarian. When I asked about or inquired about 1898, they wanted to know why. I was told that, yes, they had something, but they kept it under lock and key. The story of Wilmington in 1898 still isn't widely known. What happened here on what's now just this empty patch of grass would radically change racial politics in North Carolina. This is the story of an American election, but also of something we don't usually find in American history. The violent overthrow of a democratically elected government. In the late 1800s, Wilmington, North Carolina was the state's largest city. It had a majority black population and historians today describe it as a rarity in the post-Civil War American South. Wilmington prior to November 1898 was what the New South could be at the cusp of the 20th century. There was uh, an unusual degree of, of black prosperity. In Wilmington, there were successful black entrepreneurs, doctors, teachers, but also black elected officials. And for a time, that was true throughout the state. Take a look at the politicians on this poster of the 1889 North Carolina House of Representatives. Here at the bottom are black Republican representatives, some from Wilmington. North Carolina also sent four black Republicans to the U.S. Congress between 1875 and 1899. The Democratic and Republican parties of 1898 in many ways occupied opposite parts of the political spectrum than they do today. Most African Americans were voting for the Republican Party and the Democratic Party was white voters almost exclusively. White supremacy was the central focus of the platform for the Democratic Party. Republicans in North Carolina were successful in part because of a third party called the Populist Party, made up of mostly white farmers fed up with the tough economic times. North Carolina populists joined up with Republicans to form what they called the Fusion Party. And in the elections of 1894 and 1896, the Fusion Party defeated the Democrats in sweeping victories statewide. 
That meant North Carolina now had a government that shared power between black and white politicians, including a newly elected Republican governor. Together, they moved towards reforms that would favor black Americans and working class whites. This was something that the Democratic Party folks were not were simply not going to accept. A multiracial government wasn't just a disappointment for Democrats. It was more like a humiliation. They needed a plan to take back control of the state in the next election. So party leaders like Fernifold Simmons, future U.S. Senator, Charles Acock, future North Carolina governor, and this man, Alfred Moore Waddell, came up with one to beat the fusion party by luring white populist voters away from their alliance with black voters. Wilmington, with a large black population and a local fusion government in power, would be a focus of their campaign. Hey, the hey, pause, pause, pause it right there, Shakita. The handbook for 1898. Pause it right there. Okay. Um, we're going to continue this discussion on our social media platforms. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Uh, we'll talk. Uh, so we're going to continue this discussion there. We'll talk some more about this uh, tomorrow night. Uh, and the name of that clip is When White Supremacists overthrew a government when white supremacists overthrew a government from Vox, uh, dot com. that's on youtube um and okay and we'll, we'll talk some more about the wilmington massacre tomorrow night as well all right hey if you like this type of information you can donate to the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app then also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show paypal.me forward slash the AHN show and at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. And all my DVD lectures are there on our website as well, africanhistorynetwork.com. Remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. Melanized Media is an independently black owned and operated film company. We specialize in producing culturally enriching black films and videos at melanizedmedia.com. Join us every Sunday for Melanized Nights, where we screen a socially conscious documentary film or black historic presentation. That's every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Visit melanizedmedia.com to learn more and to register. That's M E L A N E Y E S media.com. Peace. Have you tasted the world famous No Frowny Brownie yet from the Pink Bakery? If not, what are you waiting for? They are vegan, gluten free, and free of the big eight allergens. While eating their No Frowny Brownies, the fabulous Miss Tabitha Brown said they were very good. Very good. And you know, if she says that, they are. The Pink Bakery is the first black owned Big 8 Allergen Free Baking Mix Company. Go to thepinkbakery.com, that's thepinkbakery.com, to order their No Frowny Brownie Mix today. Are you ready for a new black economy? Well, Hapi, The Role of Economics in the Development of Civilization, is a brand new documentary that will set you on a new path of knowledge and enlightenment. The Hapi film gives viewers a snapshot of our economic history from the dawn of civilization right up until today. The underlying theme of the film is the interrelationship between the three essential components of economics, politics, and culture. Hapi brings together the brightest and most prolific minds in the fields of psychology, history, business, and politics, such as Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, Dr. Julian Malvo, Dr. Zahi Hawass, and Jabari Osazi, and more. Together, they deliver a message of cooperative economics, financial independence, and a pride that we can all be inspired by. The film is on sale now. It's streaming on all digital formats or for DVD. Please visit Hapi, H-A-P-I, HapiFilm.com. Use offer code Hapi, A-H-N, for a 10% discount. All right, stand by. Stand by, everybody. Uh, okay. Let me disconnect this call from the radio station. We're going to continue here. Uh, we're going to go back to this clip. How's everybody doing? 
So we do one hour on we're on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF. I do radio here in Detroit. So uh, and then I'm on Sunday nights, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also. So we'll continue. Um, so when we go over, we'll just continue on our social media platforms because I control that. We're going to go back to this clip um, here in just a second. And all this history is connected. All this history is connected. Uh, on yesterday's show, our, our Monday, November 9th edition, we talked about how on the November 3rd um, in states during the November 3rd, 2020 election on the ballot, five states, uh, there were measures eradicating racist language and symbols in five states across the country, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Utah, things like this. So all this history is connected. That was an article from the griot.com that they picked up from the Associated Press. We talked about that uh, yesterday. OK, African-American business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. And um, you can advertise on our uh, nightly show, Monday through Friday. Uh, um, we re air you when we do the rebroadcast of these, uh, when we re air these uh, shows, when we do the rebroadcast, your video commercial will play on our social media platforms and uh also we air these shows in audio podcast format also on nine different podcast platforms so your audio commercial will air there as well we're on iheart radio itunes fm player Castbox, stitcher and other um audio podcast platforms. search for the african history network show the african history network show wherever you get your audio podcast from okay let's go back to this uh i want to go back to this clip here when white supremacists overthrew a government. Uh, this is from Vox, uh, from Vox.com. Let me, let me back up. Let me back up. Their goal, oh, hold on. consolidate the white vote by stoking white right, anger and resentment of the state in the next election. So party leaders like Fernifold Simmons, future U.S. Senator, Charles Acock, future North Carolina governor, and this man, Alfred Moore Waddell, came up with one. To beat the fusion party by luring white populist voters away from their alliance with black voters. Wilmington, with a large black population and a local fusion government in power, would be a focus of their campaign. The State Democratic Party Handbook for 1898 laid out their goal, consolidate the white vote by stoking white anger and resentment. It said, this is a white man's country and white men must control and govern it. Their most effective tool was the media. One of North Carolina's biggest newspapers was a Democratic Party mouthpiece. It ran racist political cartoons throughout 1898. Not everybody was literate in 1898, but to see a political cartoon of the type that ran, you may not be able to read it, but you know exactly what it means. Many of the cartoons were centered on the threat of Negro rule, even though the fusion government was mostly white. They also played up another fear. Black men threatening white women became a theme. White men need to do all that they can to protect white womanhood. This was all part of North Carolina Democratic strategy, but it echoed the national racist rhetoric of the time. In one speech that Democrats printed in a Wilmington paper, a prominent Georgia writer named Rebecca Felton said, If it takes lynching a black man a day to protect white womanhood, I say lynch. Her speech prompted a Wilmington black man named Alex Manley, owner of the Black Run Daily Record newspaper, to respond with a column. He made a simple observation that, at the time, was shocking. That white women who had liaisons with black men did so voluntarily and uh, enthusiastically. Manley wrote, every Negro lynched is called a big, burly black brute, when in fact, many were sufficiently attractive for white girls to fall in love with them. Manley pretty much said, 
In a nutshell, sometimes white women choose to be a black man. Manley's editorial became another tool for Democrats. Newspapers reprinted it, called it a horrid slander, and ran comments about it on a daily basis. It was just a few months before the election, and white voters were angry. By the time the election rolls around on November 8th, um, black voters, Republican voters, had been thoroughly intimidated here. By all accounts, the elections of 1898 were a sham. The Democratic Party had a paramilitary group called the Red Shirts. They attacked and blocked black residents from voting. At a rally just before the election, Alfred Moore Waddell provoked the crowds. He said, Negro office holding ought at once and forever be brought to an end, even if we have to choke the current of the Cape Fear River with carcasses. The votes were counted, and the Democrats won. Democratic candidates won every seat they had a candidate up for election. But some local fusionist politicians remained in power because their seats hadn't been up for re-election, like the white Republican mayor and the board of aldermen. And of course, the election did nothing to undo the economic power black folks held in the city. The Democrats had won the election, but their goal of total white supremacist control remained out of reach. And so they engineered what was essentially a coup d'etat. The day after the election, at a gathering for white men in Wilmington, the Democrats unveiled a document called the White Declaration of Independence. It contained an ultimatum. Cynthia Brown, whose descendants were in Wilmington back in 1898, is a historian at her church where there's a preserved copy of the declaration from the next day's newspaper. We will no longer be ruled and will never again be ruled by men of African origin. They would strip black men of voting rights. They would give white men a large part of the employment heretofore given to black men. And as for Alex Manley, we demand that he leave this city forever within 24 hours. The next morning, hundreds of white men marched to the offices of the Daily Record. Manley was gone. He had fled to save his own life. They set the Daily Record building on fire. This is where it once stood. Once the white leadership destroyed Alex Manley's printing press, they destroyed one way in which the African-American community in Wilmington could organize itself and keep itself in the world. At City Hall, the mayor and board of aldermen were forced out. There were 200 armed men in City Hall at the time. They didn't do it of their own free will. And as they resigned, a new member selected by the Democratic Party was voted into office. Waddell, who once threatened to fill the Cape Fear River with black bodies, was the new mayor of Wilmington. Meanwhile, the mob had grown to about 2,000 men, and the violence spilled into the streets. In these photos, X's mark where the first black residents were killed. The stories are that they were dumped into the river, um, and there are varying stories about how many people were killed. I see 40 to 60 I see clearly. Hold of the vibe. Tire. Residents. His great grandmother and residents never heard books in the newspaper. Yeah, you know, African American, not white ones. This is less outing and a black political representation in the state was over. It would be 90 years until North Carolina elected its next black Congress member. Wilmington did a, a really great job of covering up a very dark past for a very long time. 
Over the years, the textbooks on North Carolina's history have struggled to accurately describe what happened in 1898. This one from 1933 says the situation was unfortunate for both races. And this one from 1978 doesn't have that much more detail. But they both praise Charles Acock, a politician who helped perpetrate the riot. They say he had a keen mind and a kind heart, and that, in fact, he was one of the best friends that the colored people had in the state. It's a legacy that North Carolina has yet to fully undo. The names of the perpetrators are on Wilmington school buildings and city parks. But the legacy is also bigger than those names. Turn on the news and the state's long history of political suppression echoes. Turn to a strict new voter ID law in North Carolina. Racial gerrymandering and a push for new voting maps. The court says the Republican-led legislature redrew congressional districts along racial lines, violating the Constitution. There's a tremendous amount of intimidation that is still felt by the black community. It doesn't have to be mass mayhem and violence in the streets. The strategy shifts towards designing state laws in such a way that you can exclude blacks from uh, voter participation. The subliminal uh, pursuit of continuing the white declaration of independence. And if you don't see it for what it really is, it can happen all over again. So that's a, a brief overview of what happened uh, during the Wilmington Massacre of um, 1898, November 10th, uh, 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, that's from Vox.com. Uh, when white supremacists overthrow, uh, overthrew a government, when white supremacists overthrew a government. Uh, that's on YouTube. Then also check out the documentary from director Christopher Everett, uh, Wilmington on Fire, Wilmington on Fire. Uh, I want to go back to this article here and we'll post the links uh, to some of these. Uh, this is from uh, 13.org, 13.org, uh, The Rise and Fall of Jim Crow. And this was uh, from PBS.org also, but they have a section on PBS.org. 13.org. This deals with the rise and fall of Jim Crow. Uh, Wilmington Ride of 1898. I want to go back to this article. Then I want to go to one from the Zen Project also. Um, okay, so we talked about uh, Rebecca Felton, the white female uh, Georgia feminist who a year earlier in uh, 1897 um, in a speech that was uh, published uh, said, if it requires lynching to protect woman's dearest possession from ravening drunken human beasts, then I say lynch a thousand Negroes a week if it is necessary, end quote. So this article infuriated Alex Manley, who was the uh, newspaper editor of the Daily Record, the African-American man who was a newspaper uh, editor of the Daily Record. He replied by writing an editorial sarcastically noting that many of these so-called lynchings for rapes were cover-ups for the discovery of consensual interracial sexual relations. The discovery of consensual interracial sexual relations. So basically, this is they're talking about white women uh, willingly having sex with African American men. Okay, this is what it's talking about. And let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, let's pull this up here. Let's see. This is from um, 13. Blackpass.org has a good article also dealing with um, the Wilmington riot, Wilmington massacre also. Um, all right, let's continue here. Okay, so he replied by writing an editorial uh, sarcastically noting that many of these so-called lynchings uh, for rapes were cover-ups or the discovery of um, consensual inter interracial sexual relations. The Alex Manley article fueled raging fires. White radicals vowed to win the election. 
uh, by any means possible. Although African-American voters turned out in large numbers, Democrats stuffed the ballot boxes and swept to victory throughout the state, the state of North Carolina. Now, in that clip that I just played, when they talked about uh, gerrymandering and uh, voter ID laws, things like this in North Carolina today, that's being done by Republicans. You have to understand the party realignment between the Democratic and Republican Party that completes in the mid to late 60s. This part of this part of realignment that takes place. A lot of those majority of those Southern segregationist Democrats leave the Democratic Party and go to the Republican Party. And you're going to have uh, Republicans that leave the Republican Party, go to the Democratic Party. Um, and so you have office holders and um, voters. You're going to have this party realignment that takes place. But that party realignment goes back to the uh, Lily White movement in 1928. OK, the year before the Great Depression starts. Uh, OK, so the article infuriated Alex Manley, a, a Wilmington newspaper. He replied by writing, OK, uh, white radicals vowed to win the election by any means possible. Although black voters turned out in large numbers, Democrats stuffed the uh, ballot boxes and swept to victory throughout the state. But in Wilmington, North Carolina, the city of Wilmington, the political victory did not soften white fury. Uh, white people staged a coup d'etat and drove all African-American office holders out of office. White people staged a coup d'etat and drove all African-American office holders out of office. A mob set Alex Manley's newspaper uh, office on fire and a, and a riot erupted. White people began to gun down African-Americans on the streets. Harry Hayden, H-A-Y-D-E-N, one of the rioters stated that many of the mob were respectable citizens. Many of the mob were, quote unquote, respectable citizens, quote, the men who took down their shotguns and cleared the Negroes out of office yesterday were not a mob of plug uglies. They were men of property, intelligence, culture, clergymen, clergymen, lawyers, bankers, merchants. They are not a mob. They are revolutionists asserting a sacred privilege and a right, end quote. By the next day, the killing ended. Officially, 25 African-Americans died, but hundreds more may have been killed, their bodies dumped into the river. Okay, so check out this uh, article here. The, uh, this is from uh, the series, The Rise and Fall of Jim Crow. Uh, this is Wilmington Riot, 1898. This is from PBS.org, Public Broadcasting System, a, a segment they have, a section they have called 13, uh, Media with Impact. So check this out. Um, yeah, it's a revolutionist. Okay, and then uh, let's see here. I want to go to this other clip. We'll pull this up. I want to go to this other article from the Zen Project. Also, history.com has a good article um, as well dealing with um, the Wilmington Massacre. Also, history.com. Uh, uh, here, here's the trailer from uh, the documentary uh, Wilmington on Fire. Can we go to this here? Okay, we'll get that up. Uh, yeah. How's everybody doing? Reason. 
one problem. The one. Okay, can y'all hear? Me? The black people, black men died from gunshots. Let me back it up here. Say the Cape Verde was full of bloody black bodies that day. That black people couldn't find their way. That black men died from gunshots in their backs. That black women ran to the swamps across the tracks. That very smart and bold black men put on the train. They're given a free ride out of town where they were told to remain. They said that the dead bodies were left in the streets. The fathers know so strong that does it circle for weeks. The black babies cry and long for their fathers and a bike to eat. The black folks lost all their savings the lovers they meet. It had to be done, said the white people was gone. Up in town until the blacks tried to change it. They took over the city to restore the heritage of the city. There were heroes, too many, but they were already for today. Some folks still don't say they won't, but they did. Not any harm was done for the ones who ran and hid. Serious black people are being served in the town. That's how folks want to turn around. Now is the time to make up. All right, so uh, that's the uh, trailer of the documentary "18 uh, Wilmington on Fire" uh, from director Christopher Everett. So check that out and uh, order that. And I know he has uh, screenings uh, coming up also. Um, and you can uh, watch it on demand on Vimeo also, Wilmington on Fire. All right. Um, I want to look at this article here from uh, Zen Education Project, Z-I-N-N, Zen Education Project, November 10th, 1898, Wilmington Massacre, November 10th, 1898, Wilmington Massacre. Um, on November 10th, 1898, white supremacists murdered African-Americans in Wilmington, North Carolina, and deposed the elected Reconstruction era government in a coup d'etat. All right. Even though Reconstruction ended in 1877, uh, it was the morning of November 10th, 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, and the fire was the beginning of, of an assault that took place seven blocks east of the Cape Fear River, about 10 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean. By sundown, Alex Manley's newspaper, The Daily Record, had been torched as many as 60 people had been murdered and the local government that was elected two days prior on November 8th, 1898, have been overthrown and replaced by white supremacists. For all the violent movements in United States history, the mob's gruesome attack was unique. It was the only coup d'etat ever to take place on American soil. Lost in, in the fire that destroyed the Daily Record newspaper were the lives of African-American citizens and the spirit of a thriving African-American community and also the most promising effort in the South to build racial solidarity. Also the most promising effort in the South to build racial solidarity, Adrian LaFrance and Van Newkirk uh, in the lost history of an American coup d'etat. Um, this was, uh, I think this was a documentary that they had. Uh, so background information on, um, on Wilmington, and I'm going to pull this up here also. Uh, so before the violence, the port city of. Uh, before, uh, before the violence, the port city uh, on the Cape Fear River was remarkably integrated. Three out of the 10 aldermen were African-Americans and African-Americans worked as policemen, firemen and magistrates. OK. And as I said before, there was a there was a small African-American middle class um, uh, there in Wilmington, North Carolina. 
here is a, a here's a historical marker. Look at this article. Let's turn the screen share on. Um, let's turn the screen share on here. Just a second. How you doing, Akima? Okay, so this article here is from the Zen Education Project, November 10th, 1898, Woman to Massacre. Let's blow this up. November 10th, 1898, Woman to Massacre from the Zen Education Project. They have a historical marker here in uh, Wilmington. The mar this marker was installed in 2019. It says Wilmington Coup. Armed white men, uh, armed white mob met at Armory, uh, at Armory here, November 10th, 1898, marched six blocks and burned office of daily record, black owned newspaper, violence left, uh, violence left untold numbers of African-Americans dead, led to overthrow of city government and installation of coup leader as mayor was part of a statewide political campaign based on part of a statewide political campaign based on calls for white supremacy and the exploitation of racial prejudice. Okay. So this is a historical marker uh, that was installed in 2019 there in Wilmington, North Carolina, that tells a, a brief synopsis of uh, what happened. All right, so let's continue here. Um, so and when we look at this background history, so uh, the, the, the Democratic Party at this time was the party of the Confederacy. So the Civil War is 1861 to 1865, and then Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877. The Democratic Party was founded January 8th, 1828, okay? And, um, Originally, they're going to be known as Jacksonian Democrats, named after Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson. The Republican Party wasn't founded until 1854. And the Republican Party was founded in 1854 by groups of abolitionists. And it was basically uh, founded as a as a response to the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act of, of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act dealt with um, leaving it up to the people who lived in these westward territories um, leaving it up to them to decide whether or not they want to have slavery in these territories as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government that's the kansas nebraska act of 1854 that um and the Dem and the republican party being founded is a direct backlash to to that and then six years after they're founded um, they're going to, well, yeah, six years after they're founded, their candidate for president is going to win that November 1860 election where Abraham Lincoln uh, becomes president elect. And then six weeks after Lincoln is, uh, becomes president elect, um, South Carolina secedes from the union December 20th, 1860, because South Carolina thinks Lincoln is going to free the slaves and then um a few months later april 12 1861 the civil war starts in uh, fort sumter in um south carolina the civil war is going to start okay so uh the democratic party at the time was the party of the confederacy and they vowed to end this quote-unquote negro domination in the 1898 state legislative elections the 1898 state legislative elections. They wanted to end this quote unquote Negro domination. Their strategy was to enlist men um, who could write, uh, who could write white, white journalists and, and white cartoonists. They wanted to enlist these men who could write men who could speak um, uh, and white supremacists who whipped up emotions at rallies and uh, they wanted men who could ride uh, like the Ku Klux Klan, like a uh, group, the Red Shirts, who were basically armed ruffians on horseback. OK, 
Okay. So the white supremacist used an editorial by Alex Manley, uh, the newspaper editor, Alex Manley, the editor of Wilmington's black newspaper, the daily record, a uh, white supremacist used an editorial by Alex Manley to stir a firestorm. Um, to stir a firestorm at the time of the elections. The editorial responded to a speech by Georgia socialite, uh, Rebecca Felton, who promoted lynching as a method, quote, to protect woman's dearest possession from the ravening human beast, end quote, okay? So this is how they are depicting African-Americans at the time also. This is how they are depicting African-Americans in newspaper articles, in cartoons, uh, et cetera. And they're, and they're instilling white fear into uh, white people, especially white women, to then justify the mistreatment of African-Americans. This is one of the reasons why I don't use the N-word, because you put negative pejorative labels on people, negative pejorative names on people to relabel people to then change the way people think about this targeted group of people to then justify the mistreatment of them and to absolve yourself of any guilt that you may have. Cause you know, in general, you wouldn't treat people that look like you like that. So you have to change the way and dehumanize people. You have to change the way uh, people are perceived. You use the media to do that. And you put negative labels on people to then justify the mistreatment, justify the abuse, justify the enslavement, justify the murder, the killing, et cetera, and say, well, see, this is how these people are. This is how they act. They're subhuman. They're, they're beasts. So therefore, th this is why we have to treat them like this. Um, here's a picture of Alex P. Manley. Okay, African American man, very distinguished looking. Okay, and he had to flee uh woman to North Carolina for his life. All right. Let's continue here. Okay, so uh, Alex Manley uh, condemned lynching and pointed out the hypocrisy of describing African-American men as, quote, big, burly, black brutes, end quote, when in reality it was white men who regularly raped African-American women with impunity. He pointed out he pointed out the hypocrisy of white people, especially white men calling African-American men big, burly, black brutes. When in reality, it was white men who were raping African-American women with impunity, not being arrested, nobody going to jail, anything. He added that some relations between the races were consensual. He was talking, and this goes back to uh, the piece from the 13 from PBS, where he was talking about that a lot of these relationships between white women and African-American men were consensual. That would lead to lynchings. White supremacist rallies kept white outrage at the editorial at a P at a fever pitch. White supremacist rallies kept white outrage at the editorial that Alex Manley wrote at a fever pitch. Former Confederate Colonel Alfred Waddell, Af Alfred R Waddell uh, gave a speech suggesting that white citizens should, quote, choke the Cape Fear River with carcasses end quote choke the cape fear river with carcasses end quote if necessary to keep african americans from the polls okay so you so we have to understand this is a fight over political power this called power they they african americans held elective office and african americans were voting so here you have here you have white people who are fearing this political power that African-Americans have. And they're willing to brutalize them and kill them and use force to take them out of office. This is what's taking place. So on election day, November 8th, 1898, 
the red shirts, which is a paramilitary white supremacist organization. The red shirts patrolled African-American neighborhoods with guns. Democrats won every seat, but these were state legislative seats. African American uh, African Americans still maintain power in Wilmington's city government. African Americans still maintain power in Wilmington city government, while uh, Democrats won every seat in the state legislature. Some 800 white citizens, led by uh, Colonel, uh, led by uh, former Confederate Colonel Alfred Waddell, some 800 white citizens. Uh, led by Waddell, met at the county courthouse and produced what was known as the, quote, White Declaration of Independence, the White Declaration of Independence, end quote. Now, it's interesting that you call this the White Declaration of Independence. You should call it the second White Declaration of Independence because the first one, 1776, that was that was a White Declaration of Independence. You know, but I, I understand, but you should call this the second white declaration of independence because you already have one. But this one, the second white declaration of independence stated, quote, we, the undersigned citizens, do hereby declare that we will no longer be ruled and will never again be ruled by men of African origin, end quote. The following day, November 10th, 1898, uh, former Confederate, uh, former Confederate, um, Colonel Alfred Waddell led a mob of 2,000 armed men to the Daily Record newspaper, the black the black owned newspaper there in Wilmington that Alex Manley was the editor of, and they burned the building to the ground. They burned the building to the ground. Okay, so this is th this is the fear of the power of African Americans having control of media. And being able to tell our own stories, being able to impact the way people think, feel, act, and behave. This is a this is a picture of the of the burned down the the burnt building. It's not burned all the way down, but the burnt building. Okay, armed rioters in front of destroyed press building. Okay, and they're standing there all proud and smiling and taking a picture. Okay, while the building behind them is burning. Okay, so rumors tore through the African American neighborhoods uh, after this is taking place. The tinderbox ignited at the corner of Fourth and Harnett, H A R N E T T, the corner of Fourth and Harnett, where African Americans at Walker's grocery store faced off against white men at uh, Brunge's Saloon, B-R-N-U-J-E-S, uh, Brunge's Saloon. A shot was fired and someone yelled, white man killed. A shot was fired and someone yelled, white man killed. Gunfire erupted. Unarmed black men scattered in all directions and were gunned down. Violence quickly spread. The Wilmington Light Infantry, L-I-G-H-T, the Wilmington Light Infantry, the white government union and the red shirts poured into African-American neighborhoods with rifles, revolvers, and a Gatling gun. So a Gatling gun was basically like the first type of machine gun. When you see old, uh, when you see Western movies and they have the gun and they had multiple barrels and it turned like a revolver and they have a crank, that's a Gatling gun. Okay. That's, uh, that's named after John Gatling. Um, John Gatling, if I remember his name is John Gatling, and um, he was the inventor of the uh, Gatling gun. And this is why Jordan, uh, 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 Richard Jordan Gatling, I should say, um, Richard Jordan Gatling invented in 1861. And this is why a slang term for a gun is a GAT, G-A-T, short for Gatling, named after. Richard Jordan, Jordan Gatling, who invented the Gatling gun. OK. Um, and you'll see uh, yeah, you'll see these in old Westerns and things like that. Um, the Gatling gun, sometimes they'll have it on wheels. Um, 
what have you. In the movie The Magnificent Seven, the remake of it with Denzel Washington, there's a scene in there where the uh, army that's doing the attacking on the village, they're using the Gatling gun. History.com has an article uh, on the Gatling gun. Um, so you could check that out also. Official website of the History Channel. All right, we'll post this link here. Okay, uh, let's see here. All right. We'll continue this in just a second. African-American business owners posting in your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Now, the Black History One-on-One -on -one Mobile Museum um, has been in existence for 25 years. It's founded by Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim, Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim, and they are uh, scheduling people right now for in-person and virtual exhibits. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim was named uh, among the change makers of NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for Black Enterprise magazine. Visit his website, uh, blackhistorymobilemuseum.com, blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also give them a call, 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. All right, now, if you want to uh, repair uh, your credit or build a higher FICO score so you can uh, live a better lifestyle or buy that car or house or, or start a business that you've always wanted to, be one of the first 10 people to text the number 419-975-6341, 419-975-6341, and uh, uh Text, text the words, I'm ready now, Mario. I'm ready now, Mario, to 419-975-6341. And um, Mario Stevens will get, um, will, 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 and you'll get a call back and you'll be able to get started for free. That's right. Be one of the first 10 people to uh, text 419-975-6341 and say, I'm ready, Mario. And, um, you'll be on the path to better credit for free. Everyone after the 10th caller uh, will be eligible for a scholarship of up to 50% off, regular sign-up fees for the next 25 people only. All right. Um, have you tasted the no frowny brownies yet? The pinkbakery.com, the pinkbakery.com is the first black owned big eight allergen free baking mix company. And um, the, uh, they are vegan, gluten-free, and free of the big eight allergens. Visit their website, thepinkbakery.com, thepinkbakery.com, and order their no frowny brownie mix today. All right, let's continue here. Uh, let's go back to this article from the, uh, the Zen, Project, uh, Zen Education Project dealing with uh, November 10th, 1898, Wilmington Massacre. So rumors tore through the African-American neighborhoods. The tinderbox ignited at the corner of 4th and Harnett, where African-Americans at Walker's grocery store faced off against white men at Brunge's saloon. A shot was fired and someone yelled, white man killed. Gunfire erupted. Unarmed uh, African-American men scattered in all directions and were gunned down. Violence quickly spread. The Wilmington Light Infantry, the white government union, and the red shirts poured into the African-American neighborhoods with rifles, revolvers, and a Gatling gun. As bullets were still flying, um, former Confederate Colonel Alfred Waddell 
threw out the democratically elected alderman and installed his own alderman. This was nothing less than a coup d'etat. The hand-picked men, quote unquote, elected uh, Alfred Waddell mayor. Many African-American leaders were jailed, quote, for uh, jailed for their own safety and then forcibly marched to the train station under military escort and sent out of town. After the riot, thousands of African-Americans uh, uh, fled. Uh, after the riot, thousands of African-American citizens fled in the year 1900, two years after this uh, riot takes place in the year 1900, the North Carolina legislature effective, effectively stripped African-Americans of the vote through the grandfather clause and ushered in uh, the worst of the Jim Crow laws. OK, so check out this article here from. Um, the Zen, Zen Education Project also. And history.com has an article dealing with this as well. Uh, the one from history.com is called America's Only Successful Coup d'Etat Overthrew a Biracial Government in 1898 by Aaron Randall for history.com, official website of the History Channel. This is from October 7th, 2020. Uh, and then also there was an article from the Washington Post from a, a couple of days ago. Uh, a black voting rights activist confronts the ghost of racial terror in North Carolina. A black voting rights activist confronts the ghost of racial terror in um, in North Carolina. OK, um, and this is from uh, the Washington Post. Also, let me see here. This is from October 29. 9th 2020 October 29th 2020 and it talks about the uh, Wilmington massacre as well all right hey if you like this type of information you can donate to the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through cash app dollar sign the AHN show through cash app and then also through PayPal paypal.me forward slash the AHN show and at our website africanhistorynetwork.com follow us on our social media platforms the African History Network the African History Network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, I M H O T E P. Um, we have uh, our bun uh, DVD bundle packs, lectures that I've done, and we have uh, the Africans who were here before Columbus. The Africans who were here before Columbus. Um, it's a eight DVD bundle pack. It has a double lecture that I've done with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book "The First Americans Were Africans." Documented evidence has a lecture I did with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, then with the ancient, ancient African presence in the Americas and some other articles, one from Dr. John Henry Clark, then with Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, et cetera. So that's on fifty on sale fifty dollars. The Africans who were here before Columbus, and then also we have the um, Black Migration 1619 to 2019. Um, six DVD bundle pack, uh, also of mine as well. Black migrations. Uh, 1619 and it is I think that one includes my presentation dealing with um, six principles of political self-defense understanding how laws and policies impact the economic conditions of African Americans we also have that bundle pack in digital download format so some of these we have in uh, digital download format also okay all right so check that out at africanhistorynetwork.com all right, so look, we're going to get out of here. We're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. We have six days a week now instead of one day a week. I'm still trying to get used to this. This is a big time commitment. Uh, and we're still on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Forever. Author Melinda Merritt is the author of two books, Merritt Magic and Age of Aquarius, Spiritual Reckoning. In the book Merritt Magic, this book is about the civil rights movement of the 1960s and how her family played a very important role in this movement. 
It is about all of the civil rights leaders such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Jesse Jackson, John Lewis, and many others of this nation who came to her small Georgia town and started the movement that spread across this nation. This book tells the wonderful story of three powerful women who did amazing things because they had inherited special gifts from their African ancestry and used them to help the cause. These ancestral gifts seem to have been forgotten at this stage in our history. The second book, Age of Aquarius Spiritual Reckoning, discusses the relationship between humans and the ten spheres of the tree of life. Author Melinda Merritt was able to show some very interesting facts about the present and past presidents of the United States as it relates to what they did while in office. The current president is living up to the negative impact he has brought to this space. This book shows how astrology impacts people in ways that they may not be aware of. It discusses the change in the status of religion in this country as we can easily see. There is a major change happening in that area. Visit the website merit-magic.com. That's merit-magic.com. M-E-R-R-I-T-T. And get both books for only $20. The books Ivy and Catalina Visit Selville and Brooklyn Softball Adventures are from authors Sidney Carujo, Brooklyn Carujo, and Shanine Diles Carujo. In Ivy and Catalina Visit Selville, readers will join Ivy and Catalina as they tour the small town of Selville with their grandparents to learn about the world of science. The girls will learn about the structures and functions of the cell. This book provides great analogies that make learning about the cell easy for kids. The book Brooklyn Softball Adventures takes readers on the journey with Brooklyn through her first two seasons of playing softball. Through facing adversity, Brooklyn and her teammates build their confidence and learn to love the game. The book encourages children to try new things and never accept defeat. Ivy and Catalina Visit Selville is by Sydney Carujo and Shanine Diles Carujo. And Brooklyn's Softball Adventures is by Brooklyn Carujo and Shanine Diles Carujo. Both books are available right now at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksAmillion.com, and Target.com. Sage and Elm Apothecary creates unique products, especially with you in mind. They use simple ingredients such as whole fruits, herbs, and vegetables. Each product crafted offers a unique plant-based experience, their holistic approach to self-care formulate their product inventory. They're proud to serve our community of plant-based product supporters and offerings for the entire family. Sage and Elm Apothecary designs over 60 different beautifully handcrafted soaps, natural toothpaste, hydrating oils, deodorants, face masks, shampoos, conditioners, and so much more. Visit their website at sageandelmapothecary.com. That's sageandelmapothecary.com, A-P-O-T-H-E-C-A-R-Y. And find out about their upcoming events throughout the year. Allow Sage and Elm Apothecary to provide for all of your plant-based needs. Use promo code AHNWINTER20, AHNWINTER20 for a special discount.